And this was important because I went to the last quarter when I looked, reviewed the numbers, they didn't even mention gross margin. And when you don't mention a key metric like that, you know it's pretty bad. Hey everyone, welcome to our latest Trader Black podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales. Thanks for checking in. We continue this journey of more earnings reports. I had a good podcast earlier this week pertaining to Sundown, and we thank you for providing feedback. A lot of stuff we learned, a lot of comments going on. Don't worry, we're going to have more content pertaining to that company. And we'll make sure we answer a lot of the questions that you guys have for us pertaining to that. But for now, let's focus on our next two companies, which is Cresco Labs and Columbia Care. And welcome in Benjamin A. Smith, lead financial writer. Good to see you again. Good to see you guys. Yes. Anthony Verrill, good to see you. Good to see you. It's fucking rocking and rolling. We're let's, finally at the tail end of earnings season. Let's rock and roll. Rock and roll with Ben and Anthony on TDR. Here we go. All right. Cresco Labs reported Q2 2023 results, which on the face of it met analysts' uh, expectations, were in big improvements sequentially. Some of the stuff included revenues looking like $198 million versus $195 million consensus, up 2% sequentially versus 3% sequentially in Q1. Uh, adjusted gross margins of 47% up 100 BPS from the first quarter. Uh, adjusted EBITDA grows to $40 million from $29 million in Q1. So, Ben, it, there's a few other numbers I could outline, but uh, right now, first looking, this seems to be a good little report for uh, Cresco, don't you think? I do think it was a good report, yes. Um, if you look on a sequential basis, all the numbers you mentioned, uh, gross margin, as you mentioned, 70, 47%. And this was important because I went to the last quarter when I looked, reviewed the numbers, they didn't even mention gross margin. And when you don't mention a key metric like that, you know it's pretty bad. So uh, <laughs> so up, uh, up 100 uh, basis points uh, uh, this uh, quarter, or sorry, 10%. So it's up to 47, which is pretty good. It's near that 50% threshold. Uh, operational cash flow uh, went to 18 million, uh, which was still inclusive of 14 million one-time charge, which is up from 3 million in Q1. Net loss uh, uh, fell significantly if you take out the impairment charge. So I think on a sequential basis, it was really good, really strong, met expectations. Now I will caveat by saying that if you look at a full year, you look year over year, not quite so good. Revenue was about uh, 218 million uh, one year ago, and it's, it's now 198 right now. So Growth, if you look at the business growth, uh, probably because of price compression is going down a little bit, uh, yeah. like some of the other companies. Uh, so good good sequentially. If you compare it year over year, eh, not so much. Growth is something we don't see too often right now in this market, do we, Anthony? No. I mean, growth is growth is scarce. Growth is the narrative that needs to get re-injected back into the story. But I mean, just like Ben, I was surprised. Um, this is a pretty good earnings print. Mm -hmm. um, there's no real glaring holes. Um, in it, I mean, they re they retain their number one market position in Pen in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Illinois. Um, as we know, Illinois is price compression city. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a market in flux right now. Massachusetts truly have had to pull out of there as they couldn't even operate um, in the state. And then, I mean, Pennsylvania is a ticking time bomb once they go adult use. Yeah, um, that's another good state to have a number one market share. I mean, the growth narrative for Cresco could be reinvigorated pretty quickly. Um, the one thing that I can't get over is the fact that their Florida assets just don't perform. Um, they're, they're, they're not very strong in Florida. Two. I mean, the OMM, the OMMU numbers last week for Sunnyside, I mean, Sunnyside's got 32 dispensaries, Fluent has 33 dispensaries, and, Flu and Sunnyside almost got outsold two to one. Um, in terms of milligrams of THC sold. Um, for me, that's cause for concern. Um, you want to talk about growth narrative coming in? Florida, potentially going wreck, should be part of a growth narrative for Sunnyside. But I mean, I don't think you could really make that argument as the assets grossly underperform most of their competition in the state, um, which I'd love to get commentary from management actually on what their outlook is for Florida, why that's occurring and what they plan to do um, with those assets. How many locations do they have again in Florida? 32. 32, 32 doors. What's yep. Verano got? 70? Uh, Verano has 70. That is correct. And Verano sells them out. Verano has twice the amount of dispensaries. They outsell them four to one in terms of milligrams of THC sold. Which Trulieve have? Uh, Trulieve's got 126 uh, doors. They sell, they sold 116 million milligrams of THC 
last when, week. And when did um, when did Cresco enter the Florida market? Cresco bought. Uh, they bought one plan from Brady. That's right. That's yeah. right. Cresco, Cresco bought one plan. From Brady. After, was that before or after Verano? It was after, wasn't what do you it? Mean, before after before Verano. Uh, yes, I think Verano came in and bought move. After no, it was before. I I don't I don't know to be honest. First mover advantage. Act, but, I think you know they well. I mean, it's not. I think it's branding. To be honest, I really? mean, I think when you look at Sunnyside from a dispensary and a branding perspective, it looks like cheap corporate cannabis. Um, I think they would have been better keeping the one plant uh, branding and the one plant uh, dispensaries and banners on the door. One plant was a pretty damn good brand. Was it? Um, if you asked that, yeah, from a flower perspective, if you asked any of the consumers in the Florida market, what's the best or what's what, what's your top strain um, out of any of the producers in the state? They would have said Mac one from one plant. Hmm. Um, and I mean, Sunnyside just, they're not, they're, they're, they're not performing. Like I said, I'd love to have commentary um, from the management team at Cresco as to what's going on in the Florida market and what their strategy is moving forward because it's, they're getting their lunch eaten from the looks out of it. Now, Anthony, of speaking of commentary, um, that's one thing that I've noticed that hasn't been around uh, for Cresco Labs all that much is you don't hear much from the company. You don't no. hear a lot of any podcasts or any interviews or any like agency work or any media work. So it appears that, uh, I don't know if it's because of the Columbia care, uh, acquisition, maybe they went silent or they're blackout or on, on media relations, but you don't hear much from the company. And I think, um, yeah. you know, that's, that's something I think investors would like to hear a little bit more of and, and more, uh, company commentary. Cause, uh, it's not really out there. Oh, I mean, I think you're completely spot on. I mean, I put a tweet out last week about, no one's talking about Cresco. Like everyone talks about tier one operators and everyone talks about one of the biggest boys in the States. Um, who's doing what? I mean, when Cresco, when Illinois went adult use yeah, and Cresco came out and yeah. Cresco had the massive market share in Illinois, they were the fucking darling of the cannabis sector. You go to any conference, you go to any of the Canaccord events, it was Cresco, Cresco, Cresco um, are going to dominate. And I mean, they've fallen off as far as market awareness goes i mean this earnings print it's not the most impressive but i think it demands merit i mean they're still they're still operating pretty well um and like i said that pole position in those top three markets um that's that, that that's pretty good the uh benzenga conference in chicago last year like I remember when charlie spoke i had no idea what he looked like i really he's very he's very reserved yeah um he's very reserved he's very soft-spoken um, he's not one of the CEOs that you're going to see pounding the table on Twitter, no. um, and engaging with the I don't audience. Think I think want that, but there needs to be some sort of presence. Oh, you need that in this space. Yeah. You, you need, you need that in the space. This is a retail driven sector. True. You're right. the, the CEOs that are on Twitter, Boris, Kim, JW, uh, well, chairman, um, all, all of those guys, they get brownie points for being on Twitter. Yeah, you're engaging with. Yeah, yeah, you do need that too because I, I think uh, sometimes a lot of people forget when there's a lack of messaging. Yeah. Uh, sometimes yeah. there there could be the attitude where where you know we're in a bull, uh, sorry, a bear market, so it doesn't really matter anyway. Nothing's really moving the stock. But if you withdraw completely altogether and no one hears anything about your company for months, then that's going to facilitate more selling because people just don't have any idea what yeah what the roadmap is or where you're going. They think everything's completely silent. So. Uh, Sometimes I don't think that that's top of mind with certain CEOs and all that. Sometimes I think it's irrelevant because you're not really moving share price or the messaging is not really push, moving the needle. But if you withdraw completely, uh, that's not a good thing either from my experience. Yeah, I mean, wow. that's that, that that's a narrative that I've told CEOs um, from a consulting perspective when it comes to comms. They're like, well, the market's dead. Like we're in summer. No one's buying. I go, yeah, but you better get your ass out there and remind your investors why they need to hold your stock. Yes. Because if you don't, they're going to sell very quickly as their attention span is short and they're going to completely forget about you. They're going to be like, I haven't seen X in a very, in a while. There's no excitement. I just need, I'm going to go elsewhere. Yeah. No, and, look what happened too, and look what happened after too, like right before yeah. earnings, Cresco fell uh, after the uh, ceasement of the Columbia care deal, it fell 36% yeah. going into earnings and yet they 30. had a pretty decent print this quarter. So uh, I thought this print was going to be point. ugly. 
Like I, I definitely thought this print was going to be ugly. I thought that the revenue was going to not come in line. I thought that we were going to see a margin compression. Um, this for me is it, it's it's refreshing and I'm happy because I wasn't rooting against them. I don't root against them by any means. Yeah. I mean, I'd like for them to succeed and I'd like for them to to to, to continue to grow. Um, but yeah, this was. Do we know? Um, Kim Rivers talked last week about Florida being a six billion dollar rec market. How big is the estimated uh, market Not size? Total mar total market. Total market, I should say. Total market. What is the total market potential rec uh, for Pennsylvania? Do we know that? Uh, uh, she said four billion. Was it four? Four. Yeah. Well, it was six billion in Florida, four billion PA. Wow. I mean, PA is going to be PA is going to be big. What's the population um, of Pennsylvania? I have no idea. I think it's around 12 million. Is it not? Or I uh, it's half the size of Florida. What is, oh, yeah. I mean, what is state though for cannabis, huh? There's a lot of stuff going on up there. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a real good cannabis state. Yeah. Let's focus on Columbia care. They also reported Q2 2023 financial re results showing improved sequential metrics with margin expansion, improved cash flow, and cost reductions. Um, how do you interpret the improved, I guess, sequential markets, margin expansion and cost reductions in Columbia Care based on their uh, Q2 financial results, Ben? Yeah, I think it was a, a pretty solid quarter. I mean, nothing really jumps at me all that much besides some of the metrics that you mentioned. Um, you know, slight improvement on most of the metrics across the board. Uh, gross margins went from 37.8%, for example, to 40% this quarter. So it's a nice 2.5% uh, jump there. Uh, operating cash, uh, operating income, uh, yeah, improved a little bit as well. So there was a nice jump. So, you know, it, nothing here would excite me or, you know, necessarily get me to purchase stock, but, uh, yeah. you know, I think it was a solid quarter overall, uh, gross margins are lower than some of the other tier ones there. And they do have some, uh, uh, you know, uh, interest payments coming up, I think before some of the other operators. So there's something to think about if you're, you know, looking out to 2024 and beyond, but, uh, I think it was a solid quarter overall. Yeah. Yeah. So we're oh, seven, by the eight way, days... Pennsylvania is 13 million, not 12 million. Okay. We're seven, eight days into these podcasts. Um, quick rack, uh, recap and wrap up. What was, uh, one or two things that you think that stood out to you most regarding the earnings report? Like I look at, Terrison really grabbed a lot of attention. You know, are they the winner of this earnings season? Uh, what really grabbed, I guess, both of your attention? If there's one or two things that you could think of, I'll we'll start with you, Anthony. Um, my biggest surprise was the hate that Cureleaf got. I mean, a lot of people think that Cureleaf is a very poorly run business that is just going off of headline uh, momentum, and that they were very bearish on the opportunity that's at hand in the EU. Yeah. Um, I was very surprised um, to hear that. Yeah. Um, I mean, another thing that I'm very curious to see is how the growth narrative gets reinvigorated into this space. Um, a lot of people are saying Maryland is going gangbusters. Every earnings call, every operator was talking about Maryland. That's got to come, that market's got to come to equilibrium at some point. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to keep going up in a straight line. Um, I mean, I want to see where that goes. And then, I mean, I want to see what these companies do in Q3. Um, I'm curious to see if we see a jump in earnings. I'm curious to see if we see more margin compression. I mean, we talked about the trend with TrueLeave that six six quarters, quarter over quarter, you had declining metrics um, as it related to, to margin and and a couple of the other metrics. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I thought it was, I mean, we've said the same thing. It's everything was in line, but cannabis is not a stabilize, a, st a stabilization story. Cannabis is a growth story. Like the wind needs to come back into the sales one way or another um, and bring back that growth narrative. And I think until we see that, you're going to see a lot of muted activity in the capital markets. So what's that say about the industry, Ben? If there's not a lot of growth happening and this is a growth story, then what? What are one or two things that point out to you when you look at this earnings season? Yeah, I think it was uh, mainly a quarter of stabilization. I think uh, most of the numbers, if you look at what the analysts were expecting, were in line. So that is good. There's no huge surprises to the downside uh, or the upside, really. So, um, you know, I think it was pretty much what I expected. Uh, growth, I would echo Anthony's statement. It, growth is going to be is a big concern because uh, yeah. you know, this is an early stage growth uh, sector. Uh, going into the mid stages, I suppose, but it needs to grow in order to really move. And I, and although things are very cheap from a valuation perspective, some of the, you know, uh, price to book, price to sales, things like that, compared to regular retail, 
Um, it, it's, it's the, the fact of the matter is there's still no growth in this sector. And I think that's a little problematic because most of these companies are still drawing down the cash. So if we don't see a lot of growth uh, yeah. and margins tend, or tend to be coming down except for a couple operators, then that's not a good recipe for uh, you know further uh, constraints on the balance sheet. Um, so it right. would be nice to see if, if things can get reinvigorated and, be, and for this to become a growth story again. I will caveat that by saying, though, that some of the smaller operators, I do expect growth, uh, such as a Terrasand, such as a Merimed, because, you know, with Merimed having three dispensaries with the size of their footprint, uh, it's going to have a greater they're going to get greater torque off uh, some of the sales metrics there than, say, uh, a GTI, which has like 150 yeah. dispensaries. Right. So we, you could see better growth in Merimed and some of the smaller operators who are there. Uh, namely, Merriman and Terrace. I mean, I think you're going to see the best growth in Terrace End, um, bar none, in the next couple of quarters. Um, it's it there. That's probably the biggest takeaway from this earnings season is Terrace End's got everybody on notice. Um, I think you're right. Ziad and Jason have a. I mean, they've got a spotlight on them right now. Um, you see that getting, one comment. Somebody commented, like, this is the way a cannabis company is supposed to get run, where a CEO is staying over at the chairman's house and not spending on a hotel for like two nights. And I'm like, you know, yeah. being fruitful. But at the same time, to your point, there's very good execution team that's in play there. Jason has strategically been patient. He's gone through some backlash, I think, in some turbulent times when he wasn't making necessarily all the right news when a lot of these MSOs were expanding their footprint across the country. But looking back at it now, he's in a really, really good position, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, he's good. I mean, and actually harping on uh, Columbia Care, the one thing that does startle me is they've got thirty-seven million in cash left. That's mm. not that's that's cause for concern right now, especially mm. where the stock is. All right, gents, let's not a place to raise. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. No. So big takeaway, you, you look at Terrace and Anthony and you, Ben, you're looking at not a lot of growth and that is a concern for the industry. And we really need to watch this closely as to what happens in Q3. So fair assessments. And I think that's pretty spot on, but uh, let's switch to, this is a really, really interesting announcement. I like it. Psychedelics, big news in the industry. And I think huge news actually, where the leader in the space, Compass Pathways, entered in a securities purchase agreement with a group of healthcare specialist investors for 16 million 76,750 ADR with one full warrant exercisable at $9.93 per ADR for a three-year period, three years. So um, if the warrants are exercised, this is pretty much, I think, going to provide uh, complete or almost complete funding for the trial. This looks like it's a really good deal, uh, especially if you've got a trial being completely covered off, don't you think, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and, and I, I echo your sentiments. I love this deal, uh, and part of the reason why I love this deal is because they have a share structure in which to do that. Uh, if you look at their cap table, if you look at uh, TMXMoney.com or any one of the financial websites, they list the shares outstanding as be about, as about forty six million shares. So they're issuing uh, a little over sixteen million, which is you know as a percentage of their float is you know pretty high, but overall you're still looking at well under. You know, 65 million shares outstanding, which is really yeah. nothing. I mean, it, it's trading thin. So I think uh, they have the the shareholder base to absorb that type of share capital, and then um, of course the warrants too that will just push them over the top if they can raise another 162. And as you said, I think this fully funds their trial. I would imagine if it if those warrants are exercised. So um, you know, I think it provides a lot of clarity for for investors knowing that their trial is funded and they don't have to worry about where you know, that next check is going to come from. And I will add too that it as uh, for a grand, um, you know, looking at the sector in general, I think this yeah. is good because it shows that, um, you know, people believe in psychedelic assisted therapy. In this case, it's psilocybin, but, you know, uh, people are writing big checks for this to go through. And, you know, you, I, I, I wait to see what MAPS uh, does next because, you know, the money is there for this type of therapy. And, you know, this is really good news for the sector overall, I think. Anthony, you and I had a call this morning and you'd mentioned where you think big companies like Compass are going to start gobbling up some of the smaller companies that have great uh, research, great IP. Um, I can't help but think in addition to their trials, this money is going to help them gobble up some of the smaller companies. And we could see a lot of mergers and acquisitions happen sooner rather than later, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, I think Compass could become a platform player in the space. 
Um, but I mean, I mimic Ben's sentiment, like this financing is a vote of confidence for Compass. Like these are not unsophisticated investors. This isn't retail. This isn't a bought deal. Like this is a financing from sophisticated life sciences investors. Um, this leads me to believe that there's something under the hood at Compass that is worth investing in. Um, the stock's up 18% on 3x volume. Um, it's obviously responding well to this. It's been a very long time since I've seen a stock respond favorably right. to a financing. Um, a very, very long time, especially in the psychedelic space. Yeah. Um, this is probably where you want to be in this sector right now. I think, I mean, granted, right. I don't think this de risks it at all. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot that still needs to be executed on. Yeah. Um, but this is very, very, this bodes very, very well for Compass. Ben, what's the timeline um, on their phase three uh, trial readouts uh, for Compass? Is it this fall or is it early next year? No, it's uh, mid next year, 2024 is their first. And then they're having a, a second uh, readout, which is scheduled for sometime in 2025. So there's still okay. a long way to go. Uh, even the companies by the company's own admission, uh, they won't receive approval to 2027. And usually yeah. you know, companies are pretty hopeful. So I'm, I'm taking that as 2028 personally. Um, so yeah, it's still a long way off, but, uh, yeah, they have the money to, to, to get there now. And now, you know, I, I must remind everybody too, that, you know, maps is doing a series a financing currently, and they're yeah. trying to raise money. It's said to be in around 80 million, somewhere around there that would value yeah. the company at 200 million. So I wonder if this is going to have some knockoff effects, uh, w with what maps is doing, because of course they're on the MBA assisted therapy side, but it's sort of, you know, uh, the sort of, you know, cousins is sort of related because they're both doing this mass assisted therapy with different See where you're going with this. I think yeah. we are on, I don't know. It's, it's flat. It's dead right now. Not a lot of people want to own these stocks, but to your I point, mean, I'm, I'm actually rooting for the stock to go down compass. So you can buy. Um, yeah. 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 I'm hoping, I'm hoping this gain gets knocked out and someone just pumps this thing down or crams this thing down. Um, but to your point, of this news, yeah, because I'll start, but that's when I'll start, but I will start, but I'm going to buy this name, but I think you're, um, you're bang on Ben. Anytime there's been any kind of positive news for the industry, compass is always performing and, uh, best and timely fashion to put this deal together, knowing that we've got any day now with maps readouts about to happen. So who knows yeah, when that'll it's happen. Up, it's that's not long way away. It just, like approval is not till 2027 by the company's own admission. Maps okay, is, so is, is now. Maps approval is expected to be next year. So well, what do people I, lean to and buy the most? Like they buy. So since I said since I said Compass was up seventeen percent, it's now up uh, another three percent and another four hundred thousand shares traded. Wow, Shit. the warrants are going to exercise maybe by someone, the end of today if we're if you know nine ninety three if we don't. By the someone way, a chunk. by the way, all views on the Trade to Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are purely opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or guests as investment advice. And the views on this podcast are solely to be informational, right, Ben and Anthony, and not yeah, don't listen to anything I say, and not investment <laughs> advice. Yeah. I don't I have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't own Compass. Don't listen. I to am it. a village idiot when it comes to the capital Where, markets. Where'd you guys go? Where'd you guys go? Yeah. All right, don't listen to anything I say, and don't put your just. It's all purely informational. Good information and feedback we got from the Sundial crowd. I know some of them were like, yes. Others were like, what the hell, man? Do your homework. And I was like, all right. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Which the things that they were saying for me to do my homework on, we just basically, they were refuted by the call we just had with the CEO. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm all for admitting when I'm wrong, but I wasn't wrong. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, great company though. Yeah. Good conversation. After talking and Zach was, Zach was impressive. Was um, very Zach impressive. was very, very impressive. That's a sharp dude. I would, I'm very confident that Sundial is going to be one of the preeminent players in the space, especially if his thesis is right about Canada. Yeah. And for all our viewers out there, we are reaching out to his team to schedule the time. So we'll get back to you in the comment section below to our uh, below to uh, outline when that day and time will be when we interview uh, Zach George, which uh, I know a lot of you are highly anticipating that podcast. So we'll make sure that gets done sooner rather than later. Um, gents, midweek, thanks for checking in. Appreciate the updates. Got a little positive momentum with psychedelics, which is kind of great. And uh, we'll see where this goes. But I love the weather, but I'm ready to bring on the fall. Let's get out of these summer doldrum days. Yeah, yeah let's get football definitely. going too.
Yeah, football's right around the corner. Delvin Cook, J E T S, burns your Dolphins. I'm I'm hoping that Aaron Rodgers just looks like a very old Aaron Rodgers, but I don't think that's going to happen. No. Okay, let me throw this out here. I was looking at some of the futures on on the sports book, and uh, let me throw out a couple teams. Uh, tell me whether you go over or under. So the Jets currently, I are right now are nine and a half wins over futures. Over, over. Under. Dude, but no. They got a great I mean, defense. Look at the division they're in. They got to play the Dolphins twice. They got to play the Ravens twice. They got to play the Bills twice. How many wins did they have last year? Eight? I couldn't tell you. Uh, I eight. think they had eight. Yeah, they went eight and nine. I think nine and a half. I think nine and I think nine and a half is a very compelling number because I think that everyone could beat themselves up and they could probably still get in the playoffs with nine wins. What about Dolphins? Nine and a half. Under. Over. Under. Under. under? Oh, would, oh, I'm over. What'd they do to improve their team this past? Who'd they sign? Anybody? Are we really going to go there? <laughs> they Who signed Jalen Ramsey, didn't they? They signed Jalen Ramsey. Oh, until, yeah. Until, oh, until December. Ugh. Nope. Dolphins aren't making the playoffs this year. What? I think Ramsey's a little overrated no. myself, too. But What? Just, yeah. Dolphins are not making the playoffs this year. I know he's a pro no. bowler, but. Jalen Ramsey is not overrated. He must have had a bad couple games when I watched Well, it. regardless, he's gone till December. The team I'm concerned with on the bubble a little bit is Buffalo. I think Buffalo, like, I've, I'm a little, I don't know what to think of them. I think they're going to have a tough time in the regular season this year. Buffalo's like, 10 and a half over under. I think they get maybe 10 wins this year. Well, it's funny because there was a, you don't remember the meme I sent you guys yesterday? It was cut, it was start, cut, start, bench, cut. Joe Burrow, Jalen Hurts. Josh Allen. And I answered that without even thinking about it. I'm starting Joe Burrow, benching Jalen Hurts, cutting Josh Allen. Yeah. I'm with you on that. 100% I'm with you on that. I don't know. I don't Joe know if Burrow, Josh Allen's that guy. Joe, Joe Burrow's the guy. Joe Burrow's the dude. Yeah. Like you can't you can't yeah. fix stupidity. And that linebacker that, you know, had that personal foul hitting the uh was it Mahomes that hit it out of bounds? Like, or maybe it was the uh, I forget about Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm like, that's that's a 55 yard field goal. They're not making that in like cold weather. And this, I I think Joe Burrow is. I think Cincinnati gets it done this year. Like as much as as much as well, at least represents the AFC. I know everybody's loving Mahomes and and Kansas Dude. City, but. I really think that Cincinnati has upgraded their offensive line. I love Joe Burrow. I think the Bengals and Chiefs are going to turn into a fierce rivalry, and this year the Bengals represent the AFC. I mean, I I agree with you. I'm just trying to play the odds game. If that guy goes back to the Super Bowl again, like... He's not. He's not. Cincinnati's going back to the Super Bowl. No, I'm saying if Joe Burrow goes back to the Super Bowl again... Like, By the way, we never talked about this, but wow, Dave Portnoy sold Penn National for eight hundred and fifty million dollars and bought that company back for a dollar based on Penn National par up partnering with ESPN, launching ESPN bets in a deal that's going to be two billion dollars. And once this becomes finalized, like the whole media landscape is just changing drastically. But ESPN is eventually going to become a streaming service versus cable provider, where they'll lose the revenue but make up money on this whole betting pat- platform. But Wow, what'd you think of this deal? That was uh, to, to genius. Be genius. I mean, I don't think it was. I mean, let's be real though; it wasn't purposeful or planned. I mean, Disney basically came in and went to Penn and said, "Hey, he's got to go for us to come in." And hey, he's got to go. You're talking Dave Portnoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just Disney. I mean, Disney's now woke, rosy, happy-go-lucky. Uh, Enterprise. So, I mean, Dave Portnoy is the complete polar opposite of that. And he's got some baggage. So Disney can't be aligned with, with somebody like that. What's so the they first said, hey, thing that Dave Portnoy is doing after rebuying that company for a dollar? You guys want to take any guesses? I think he's just going to make it a fun media company. I think he just puts it back to what they were, like the fabric of Barstool, which yeah. was just slapdick sports coverage. Yeah. Forget the betting landscape. 
this is just going to become a fun media company, a 21st century, I don't know if you can use that term anymore, but a new millennial media company, which is brilliant, really, because they've got yeah. the audience. I don't think I ever used their betting app. I was just so interested in all their shows and production they uh, produced. Sports betting's gotten popular. All right, gents. This is going on 30 minutes now. Time to go buy. Well, no, it's not investment advice, but I was going to say maybe I should go buy some Compass stocks, but. You don't buy it today. No. On that don't buy on that move. Don't buy it today. Don't be chasing. We have discipline around here to a degree. Try to. Okay. Uh, All right, guys. Good seeing you. Bye. Oh, what? What do you know? They sold another 300,000 shares. It's up 27% right now. 27? What do you mean? It's up 10% since we started the podcast. The warrants are going to exercise today, for God's sakes. It's their the already in the month. Warrants were nine ninety three. Thirty thirty cents away from the warrants. From the warrants, yeah, the stocks at nine sixty nine right now. Holy man, that's when you know you're having a good day. When the warrants exercise the day of the the deals announced, uh, you're having a pretty good day. Let's go, Jack. Amazing. I'm telling you, give me some good readouts from uh, Maps, and this industry is going to wake up in a hurry. Yeah, I just don't like this. this is it's taking forever, though. My gosh, to invest well, in biotech, this thing was supposed to be any day now since May. So, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, this is an impressive move, a 25% move on financing. Yeah. Okay. Market I will check yeah. back in with you guys later this week, by the way, before we go, Mary Med Friday, we're going to be speaking with John Levine. We want to talk about growth. They actually are one of the few companies providing growth within this industry. Stock's been hit hard the last couple of weeks, but there's some interesting information they shared with us uh, today that we plan to break down and go through in an editorial piece that you're doing, Ben and uh, an interview with CEO John Levine that you and I, Anthony, will be doing later this week. And we're going to walk all those things through our viewers to really understand how the industry should be performing outside of just how the MSOs perform. Because like, to your point, Ben, earlier in this podcast, there's some smaller players that had some great results, and we need to dive a little bit deeper to explain that. But uh, that'll be Friday. We'll probably post that up on our traditional Sunday Night Trade to Black Weekly episode. But for now... Good day, and I'll check back in with you guys later this week. Talk soon. Take Thanks, care. Guys. Hey, everyone. So what would you think of the interview? Did you like what we asked? Is there any information you want to learn more of? Then leave a comment below and let us know what you think. As usual, share this video with your network, smash that like button, and most importantly, make sure to subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.